Books, uh, Poetry Book Club, take two uh, for this book, Alok Menon's uh, Your Wound, My Garden. They are a non-binary, gender fluid, I mean gender queer, gender non-conforming uh, South Asian poet and author of this book, Your Wound, My Garden. And they're also a, uh, an educator, an activist, and their pronouns are they, them, and not he, him. My pronouns, by the way, are also they, them, not he, him. We got disconnected earlier, which is why I'm doing that take two. I'm going to read two more poems, and that was the whole point. Let me, yes, I think I'm going to have to buy a tripod, my friend that was saying earlier. And, yeah. So, you know By the way, uh, I have another teacher design uh, that I want to show you while we're here. Uh, infinity, this is from my line, infinity is the opposite of perfection. So while I was waiting, I'm waiting for Brenda to come back from the restroom, we can take a look at this design. It's a line from one of my poems, Infinity is the Opposite of Perfection, which I feel like that one line alone can be turned into a whole workshop for uh, overcoming perfectionism, uh, a workshop on productivity in the workplace, how you know perfectionism can ironically make workers less productive. Uh, yeah, you know, I feel like as somebody, a friend of mine, the founder of the poet life said it's time us poets uh, learn the difference between the poetry community and the poetry industry and really learn how to get into the industry so that we can actually make a career make a living from our craft and one of the main ways to do that is to teach workshops for uh, you know for businesses and corporations and things like that you know So, while I wait for more people to show up, I think I'm going to read one of my poems as a way of, uh, yeah, as a way of, you know, waiting. Hello, welcome. Yeah, sure. Some space. Are you here for the Poetry Book Club? Or? No, is that going to start? Yeah, it's a Poetry Book Club right now. Oh, right it's, now? Yeah, kind of a private oh. space, yeah. yeah. I, just, I, I just want to eat. Oh, yeah, it's, it's not a... Uh, all right, well, yeah. you might just sit in the corner. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'm going to look for some shade, too. Yeah. All right, this is called What It Costs You To When You Dehumanize Me. It's an original poem by me.
call me cunning snake because you envy my flexibility even though you have legs that can jump and move faster. Call me sly fox because you envy my wisdom even though you have a bigger brain. Call me stupid sheep because you envy my ability to cooperate and commune with others even though you own an empire. Call me big bad wolf because you envy my badass energy even though your own unrestrained strength has almost destroyed the whole world while I only brought down three houses. Call me scorpion because you envy my clear aim when striking for what I desire even though you have entire armies getting you what you want. Call me weeds because you envy my tenacity and ability to be everywhere connected to everything even though you could have this too. If only you allowed yourself the humility to see how much in common you and I are. Call me gorilla because you are scared of how much you have hurt us all. And you are afraid we will retaliate, even though it's only you that keep escalating disproportionately throughout history after claiming false victimhood. Call me beast because you have lost your own humanity and can't see mine, even though you ironically lost your own humanity while trying to dehumanize me. And finally, <laughs> call me kitten because <laughs> call me kitten because now, now, you're so scared after imagining threatening fragments of me, even though you'd be whole and safe. If only, if only. You see my humanity. Oh. Welcome, America, to this poetry book club for this book, Your Wound, My Garden by Alok Menon. This is the second take because we got disconnected. Uh, like me, uh, Alok is a non binary uh, gender queer poet. I'm also non binary gender fluid. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and Alok's pronouns are also they, them. And yeah. This is this book is almost like a glossy magazine. In addition to the poems, there's some gorgeous uh, photography of the poet. Look at how gorgeous these pictures are. Look at this one. So this one. Some amazing pictures. Hello. So. I also want to show you some art I made based on the book. This one, based on my favorite lines from the poems. This is from the line, things are not only spoken into existence, they're spoken into extinction. Here's another airplane, I'm gonna wait. Hi, Brenda, Brenda's back. I'm just showing people the art I made based oh, yes. on the, one of the quotes. This one says, So you're great. So when you receive the praise and the positive feedback, things are spoken into existence and they become greater and greater, you know. And then when you're told to shut up or stop or when you're gaslit, uh, when your history is literally erased and rewritten, uh, it's spoken into extinction, you know. Literally, demonization and exotification uh, goes hand in hand, you know, and that's how uh, things are spoken into extinction. Not only spoken into ex extinction, in our case, uh, it's some next level gaslighting because what happens is that Hindus, we've come to the point where a lot of Hindus don't even dare to call ourselves Hindus anymore. I've noticed even at some open mics and lives, people call themselves Indians instead of Hindus. I'm like, yeah. that's rather weird. Like, 
Christians are allowed to call themselves Christians. Muslims are allowed to call themselves Muslims. They don't call themselves Arabs or Pakistani or whatever. You know, they call themselves Muslims. Hindus are the only ones where we've suddenly are afraid to call ourselves Hindus. Literally, like, that's what's been happening. And that's a whole other form of erasure, right? So because of that, what's happening now is a lot of white people, especially white women, will come to India, right? This is called the U-turn theory of colonization. They will come to India uh, and, you know, be with our gurus and our rishis and be profoundly respectful and reverent, right? Uh, and that's why they keep using the, the term, oh, but we're so respectful, right? And what happens is they'll be profoundly reverent, they'll take all of the knowledge and they'll go back to Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, and they will modern, modernize it, make it scientific, and then sell it as their own. But the next level that they do is they, they actually come back to India. They come back to the cities, the major cities where people are more disconnected, and they will sell back our own culture back to us as scientific and modern. That's next level colonization. Yeah, that's, colonization. Yeah. So that's more than just being spoken into extinction. It's like our culture not only spoken into extinction, but being resold back to us as mm -hmm. theirs. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. I could think of a couple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. true. It's, it's yeah. again, back to the gaslighting. Right. You know, yeah. just completely being fooled. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Stripped and then fooled. Mm -hmm. Especially since we're called, you know, we're always forced to keep reaffirming that we're secular, which, by the way, even the term secular is actually a Christian idea. It's not a non religious idea at all. It's, it literally comes from Christianity. If you do your research, you'll find that. And so it's, it's funny to me that how countries like Saudi Arabia can openly call themselves an Islamic state, right, where, by the way, Hindus, Jains, Buddhists, were not allowed to worship uh, in our ways openly, we're not allowed Hindu temples there, we're not allowed Buddhist pagodas there, we can only worship inside our own private homes. If we try to worship outside our home, our heads will be chopped off, literally. Whereas in India, where, you know, mosques are allowed, where literally, like, you know, mosques are built on top of our temples, uh, we keep having to prove that we're secular. Like, like, if we even dare to call ourselves a Hindu state, uh, I, can't, I can't even imagine what will happen to us. Actually, I can't imagine because I know what happened to my country, Burma, when the democratically elected government before the 60s had the audacity to call itself a Buddhist state. It pissed off the Hindu, it pissed off the, not the Hindus, it pissed off the Christians, it pissed off the Muslims, to the point that they destabilized the country where the democratic elected government had to give temporary emergency power to a military general for one year. And even though that general gave it, gave it back to the democratically elected government after one year, he got a taste of power. So about two years later, uh, he did a military coup. He took it back. Unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's how it all started. That's so why we have, uh, we've had the longest running, running civil war in the history of the world because of that. So yeah, actually, I can imagine what would happen to India if it had the audacity to declare itself interesting. Yeah. You're right yeah. about that. Yeah. 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 I, I, I very rarely yeah. hear people identify mm -hmm. as Hindu. Exactly. Very rarely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it's good to know why, mm -hmm. you know? It's good yeah. to be informed. Yeah. Yeah, because even in the U.S., it's not only acceptable to be Hindu-phobic, it actually raises your status. It, it, you're seen as a cool social justice type uh, if you're Hindu-phobic, which is why, like, little girls as young as three years old are bullied 
for wearing the Hindu bindi or the tikka on their forehead, whereas adult grown white women, or in really anybody who is not of the culture, wears a bindi or a tikka, it actually raises their status. Right, as like yeah. an accessory. Yeah. Yeah. They're seen as cool, as spiritual, mm-hmm. right? So that's the whole problem with appropriation. It's not so much that uh, they always turn the conversation into back into the reverse victimhood thing where, you know, they ask questions like, oh, why aren't we allowed to to appropriate your culture, basically, right? And it's like, no, the real question is, why aren't we, the people of the actual culture, not allowed to just live our culture? Right. Because what's happening to, for example, Chinese practitioners, TCN practitioners, is that uh, traditional Chinese language and practitioners, they're literally getting arrested as frauds. Whereas you know, white women who graduated from white-led schools are legally certified, certified and they make lots of money. Whereas the people of the actual culture are literally getting arrested in the U.S. And I feel like that, yeah, I feel like that is what will happen eventually to yoga and Ayurveda. Like the actual Indians, the actual Hindus, there may come a time when we'll get arrested just for being authentically practicing our actual yoga. Whereas the colonized version of yoga is just stretching, right. is exalted, and people make lots of money from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely glorified from it. Yeah. 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 <sighs> the ultimate erasure. Yeah. And criminalization. Exactly. It's, just, it's the same strategy over and over in all of these different aspects yeah. of our world and our cultures. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So let me read. Uh, Erica is saying, wow, exactly. These are the things that we don't know. This is why I highly recommend people also read this book, Rearming Hinduism by Professor Vansi Jolari. And you can see a picture of a statue of our deity with the arms cut off. So that's where the reference Rearming Hinduism comes from. It's not about taking off weapons. It's literally about taking back our literal arms because they were literally cut off. And that's why the subtitle is Nature, Hindu Phobia, and the Return of Indian Intelligence. It will really educate you on this topic. Like, lately, uh, our mutual friend AJ asked, when did you recognize your pen change? It was after reading this book. It was this book that told me that, for example, uh, there's this constant programming that the colonial violence, the colonial nature is human nature. It's not. Human nature is so much bigger than that. I believe in humanity and human nature. This is why I don't believe in good and bad, or being a good person or a bad person. I just believe in being human because I believe in humanity. Speaking of which, there's a good segue into one of the poems from this book, Care is Our Natural State. Okay. Weird oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. All right. I think I'm all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, this is Brenda, by the way. Hey, guys. Oh, yeah. I forgot to take my mask off. Oh. I'm back. <laughs> back. Brenda's back. I'm back, but I'm back for a poem and then um, heading out. I just want to thank Kundan publicly for hosting. This has been so fun. You're welcome. And meaningful. Yeah. So, this is called Care is Our Natural State which speaks to what I just said, you know, really believing in humanity itself and being human rather than being a good person or a bad person. Like, I just believe in being human, period, because I believe in humanity. Care is our natural state. Once upon a time, I was born because of other people. I was fed and taught how to live because of other people. I became me because of the love of strangers who became my family. Love, compassion that didn't make sense, but made survival. What if love then is the organizing force of the universe? Economists talk about self-interest, but the subject they conjure is a projection that they position as a prophecy for profit, not humanity. Listen to the poets instead. Yay! (laughs) Listen to the poets instead. They, meaning the economists, 
They take greed and peddle it as human nature. They take selfishness and masquerade it as our original state. But before language, I was a baby crying out in need. Being born is a natural disaster, and someone helps us make it out. James Baldwin once said he could never be a pessimist because he was in fact alive. I felt what he meant. Do you? I can't get home safe alone and have to call a friend. I can't get out of bed and have to call a friend. I found you there, hidden on the other side of I can't. I love and need you because I'm honest. Care is our natural state. Poem. What do you think of it? Um, I'm. I claim this poem. I, yes. Yeah. I think that. You know, we're we're fed a lot of information. Mm -hmm. um, so much of it that makes us defensive. Mm -hmm. You know, among people that we love, right. we often hurt the people that are closest to us. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of instances this last week where I hurt people close to me, mm -hmm. and vice versa, because we're just at, at high alert. But to to claim um, the understanding that that to be caring and loving is our natural, most basic human state is, is true. And I think it'll help us raise all of our vibration. If human, we claim yeah. that, it's, that is what is being human. Yeah. Not to demonize the other, not to demonize ourselves, but to claim ourselves as caring is very powerful. Yeah. Very yeah. subversive. Thank you so What's much, that? Bravo, for being Yes, here. thank yeah. you for having me. And yeah. everyone, come to the book club next month. Come to the book club next month. Yes. I am doing the same book again, uh, partly because it's also Pride Month and the author happens to be queer and in addition to being South Asian and so and also partly because the bookstore still hasn't been able to claim the books I'm giving them more time uh, so there seems to be a boutique limited edition book of some sort but we could uh, probably order it directly from the author's website you can website. order it directly from mm -hmm. the author's website as well and yeah. then and then we'll come and hang out in our Vita bookstore, which is super super adorable yeah. in Tustin, which is yeah. also super cute. Yeah. Um, with a great tea shop next door. Um, and lots going on over here. So yes. people come check it out. And mm -hmm. much love to Kundan. Thank you. You're welcome. Again for Peace and love. Peace. Bye. Yeah. We'll see you later. Sure. Have fun. Bye. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I'm about to grab this up myself. I will read one more poem from the book, and then I will bid adieu to all of you as well. This is called New Year's Revelations. Every year, the author writes, puts out a, a list of New Year's Revelations about what they learned uh, in their previous year. And this is a list of 11 points that they learned, uh, which is, I think, a powerful way to wrap up this book club. Uh, <clears throat> New Year's Revelations. One, there are far more pursuits, there are far more worthy pursuits than being liked, like being. Two, not all knots need to be untied. You are not for everyone. You are for you. How devastating, how gorgeous. Three, their fear is not your own. Emancipate yourself from their shame. Protect your beauty. Four, authenticity is an orientation, not a destination. Live many lives, each one as true as the last. Five. Failure is stagnancy, not sinking. Perhaps the treasure you were seeking was waiting there all along, beneath your capsized ego. Perfection is a eugenic ideal. Perfection is a eugenic ideal. Love people for who they are, not what you think they should be. 7. No one is going to rescue you. This is not a tragedy. It's an opportunity. Become the person you are waiting for. 8. Feeling is dangerous. But what do you call dissociation? Better to know the origin of bruise than not. 9. There are words and worlds that don't exist yet. Make them up. Few things are more real than fiction. Few things are more real than fiction. Ten. Design murals for all the miracles.
paint them in every conversation, make hope contagious. 11. Once upon a time, someone felt your loneliness. Fine ancestors become their living memorial. So, Erica, out of the 11 points, let me know what resonates in the comment below, which one uh, you like the most. I really like the last point the most, and also the sixth point when they said perfection is a eugenic ideal, which is why I have a, uh, a t-shirt as well as a line from my poem that says, infinity is the opposite of perfection. Uh, in fact, I have the t-shirt right now, which I can show you. So this is my t-shirt design. And then, I also like the last point. Once upon a time, someone felt your loneliness, find ancestors, become their living memorial, right? And, and then I also have, before I wrap up, I wanted to point out not the t-shirt again that I have, that, that I designed, since it's Asian API Heritage Month, Asian American Pacific Islander. On this side is Yuri Kochiyama, who was a Japanese American activist. And she was a friend of Malcolm X, and together they created coalitions between Asian Americans and Black American activists. And yeah, that was Yuri Kochiyama. And then on this side is Nupal Justice, who is the, uh, the founder and leader of Black Lives Matter New York. So I painted this by hand using 3D fabric paint, and in the middle you see Be Political. So yeah. I make my own t-shirts. Uh, someday I might sell these designs. Uh, right now it's just for myself. Uh, although recently my Vedic astrology report says that I could make good money with uh, some clothing. Uh, and really anything to do with creativity in general, but especially uh, clothing and... Uh, Hi Dante. Welcome, welcome. You just got here as I was about to wrap up. Uh, but yeah, I can read the, la the last line here again, Dante, and let me know what you think, because I love this line. It's from this book, Your Wound, My Garden, uh, from their poem, New Year's Revelations. Once upon a time, someone felt your loneliness, find ancestors, become their living memorial. Let me know what you think of that line. And then there's another related line from the same poem, Perfection is a eugenic ideal. Uh, yeah, this fear of imperfection, fear of insecurity, fear of just being human, right? Which is why they want it to be perfect. That's what the eugenicists wanted, this illusion of perfection when in reality Nature isn't perfect. Nature is infinite. It's beautifully infinite, beautifully flawed. And yet, not perfect, and that's okay. As I said earlier, I like to reclaim nature, reclaim my humanity. I don't believe in being a good person or a bad person. I just believe in being human because I believe in humanity. People who believe in being a good person or a bad person, you can tell it's very revealing when they believe that. They don't believe in being human, in humanity. That's why they believe in this ideal of being a good person or a bad person or a perfect person. This false binary. is. And on a related note, they also don't believe in nature. They believe, they've bought into the colonial idea that colonial violence as human nature or, or just nature itself, when in reality that's colonial nature, it's colonial programming. That's why I refuse to watch some, a lot of, I really stopped watching a lot of colonial media, you know, like, I like Amazon's Wheel of Time, I stopped watching after episode three, because I, there was too much of this colonial programming of the inevitability of violence, which in this related book, 
rearming Hindus and Professor Bansi Jalari talks about. It's not inevitable. Nature is so much more than violence. It includes violence, but it's, that's not it. You see, it's the overemphasis on the violence that's the problem, on the brutality. That is what the colonizers tried to do. You know, even in nature documentaries, for example, they will sh really show a close-up and really sensationalize, you know, a cheetah or a leopard or a tiger, you know, chasing a deer and killing it and eating it. When in reality, out in the wild, that might happen once a day or maybe even once a week because that deer can last that cheetah quite a few days, you know. Whereas factory farming, where they're killing like billions of animals in this horrifically violent way, is on a whole other different scale. No other animal does it. And they're trying to justify it by saying it's nature or human nature. Same thing with the violence against, you know, their colonial subjects, you know, when they wage wars on this huge systematic scale, then again, no other animal does it on that big scale. No other animal has invented a nuclear weapon and dropped it on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Only, only human beings and only a specific group of human beings, the colonizers, did that. So it's neither nature nor human nature. I only believe in humanity and being human. And with that, I'm out. Peace and love.